everybody, Flash Notion, the Ponified Talking Head here, and we're going to be talking about My Little Pony, the movie. Oh yeah, we're doing this. <laughs> I finally got to watch it, and if you would like to see my commentary of it, check out the links in the description. I'm starting to use BitChute now. Hopefully that stays up longer than, uh, what was the other one? VidMe? Yeah. Hopefully this one works out longer. In any case, uh... Actual review. The <laughs> I'm a little bit giddy right now because I've been wanting to talk about this for a while because it's been a while since I w- watched it uh, and I want to talk about it. For those of you who, for some reason, have not yet seen the movie, uh, well, non spoiler is possible. My reaction to the movie, my opinion of it, like. If you were to ask me, was it a good movie? As a brony, my reaction, my answer would be something along the lines of... um... Yes! Yeah, that. (laughs) Uh, As a more casual moviegoer, yeah, I thought it was okay. Like, the visuals were really stunning looking. Uh, The sound design was pretty good. And the songs, they were catchy, if not actually all that memorable. Well, except for maybe the villain song. The writing characterization was better on the established characters. It was more subtle. But overall, it was still pretty decent. The plot was definitely tailored to sell toys, but it still works. So, yeah, I I would definitely say, if you haven't seen it already, it is worth seeing. I'd put it in the 6.5 to 7.5 range for non-bronies. Probably 8.0 or higher for actual bronies. So, let's get to the meat of the review. And I'd like to start off by comparing this to the other most recent pony thing that came out, the Season 7 finale, because I did not like the Season 7 finale. And I know a lot of people are going to disagree with me, but I I just I can't bring myself to like it. It's not that it's bad, it's that it's frustrating, and I always find frustrating things are worse than things that are genuinely bad. It all comes down to pacing and a weak villain, Uh, The pacing of the Season 7 finale was designed after the Season 1 premiere, which is one of the worst paced things in the Generation 4 of MLP. Um, So yeah, that that was a horrible, horrible decision to do that. They did it on purpose, so horrible decision. And as for the villain, the Pony of Shadows, he never felt like a threat to our heroes. I always felt that they could beat him. And he never even tried to threaten any civilians. I mean, all the other villains have. You got Nightmare Moon blasting guards with lightning. Discord was messing with pony villains. Chrysalis, the changelings, they imprisoned Canterlot people. Sombra enslaved the crystal ponies. The Plunder Seeds even attacked regular ponies. And Tarek was just sucking the magic out of everyone. Starlight was a bit more of a special case, but, I mean, she was hurting people by getting them into her cult, so... And then she broke time. Yeah, I mean, like, there have always been consequences outside of the main six for all the other villains, but not with the Pony of Shadows. He looked cool, and he could have been written to be amazing, but he just wasn't. The movie, on the other hand, fares much better on both of those accounts. Uh, For pacing, well, it never really lingers in any one place for too long. Everything just flows very nicely. I have a slight issue with the pirates, that felt a bit too fast, but I mean, power of pony music, right? Things just move right along. (laughs) So it works. And as for threatening villains, I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, The worst of the villains, villainous characters was definitely Grubber. I mean, I I hate that little hedgehog thing, it's just, he's the worst new character. I mean, 2 out of 10 at best, please just don't bring him back, ever. I did laugh at a couple of parts with him, but I kind of regret the fact that I laughed at a couple of parts with him. His only real contribution was uncovering that Trojan cake, so could have just written him out pretty much. I will give him and the writers credit for one bit. They didn't use the whole when a character goes over the waterfall they're dead trope. They didn't. He didn't just assume that, he was just too lazy to investigate, which, you know, I'll give him credit for that. Uh, we'll move on to the Storm King himself, the big bad. He was a lot goofier than I was expecting, but I think it works. It's been a while since we actually had a goofy villain, the goofy villain being Discord. 
but it's notable in this case that he's doing it on purpose. Like, the Storm King wants to be the villain. He, he wants to be the bad guy. He's uh, kind of like the reverse Flash um, from the Flash mythos in a way. Like, uh, let me be evil is the trope, I guess. It's an uh, interesting take here. And I did I did, actually did not recognize Lee Schreiber's voice. <laughs> uh, but I, I actually think that works in the movie's favor in this case, because I, I really hate being distracted by voices that I recognize, but I can't name or fa- put a face to the name or whatever. Talk about that more in a little bit. And the Storm King, in spite of being goofy, though, uh, he was actually very intimidating at a couple of points. Like, when he was climbing up the rocks to get to the staff, he was, he was moving very animal-like, and it was actually kind of creepy. And, um... Probably the best moment, though, was very early on in the movie, when he was talking to Tempest through the spell, and he threatened her. Um, your horn won't be the only thing that's broken. Like, the way he said it, the threat was just... I mean... That's the threat of torture. We've never really had the threat of torture in MLP before. So, um, speaking of Tempest, uh, while the Storm King was the big bad, Tempest is pretty much the main villain of this movie, and she does a great, great, great job of it. I mean, she took down the princesses in record time, and she's very capable in hoof-to-hoof combat. And I saw in another video somebody talking about that and how it makes sense, because she would have grown up outside of Equestria without magic, and she would have been able to... or she would have needed the way to defend herself. Apparently she's also, like, related to Mario or something, because she can jump really freaking super high. <laughs> that was a joke. Uh, she's not related to Mario. Of course, I mean, if you wanted to do, like, a parody of Mario games with ponies, Tempest would be a great pony to use. Whatever, I'm, I'm getting sidetracked here. Let's not go into that. Um, her broken horn, in addition to being angsty and dark uh makes her magic unstable and insanely destructive which is interesting i don't think i've ever read anything that has ever said that broken horns could be used that way sorry i had the i had to cut because i uh sniffles but yeah uh, tempest is just a very ruthless and relentless villain almost terminator like in a way her reformation though i knew it was coming i knew it was going to happen because spoilers in a way, sort of. Like, it was all over FIM fiction that she was redeemed and that she was being shipped with Twilight. But the way that it happened, the way that she came around, was actually very interesting. And afterwards, if anything, she was even cooler. I mean, I, I really felt bad for her with the, her past, the way her horn was broken and everything like that. I mean, the scene was itself was really cool for the Easter egg of the Ursa Minor, but just seeing that story, it really made me feel for her, and it it just raised more concerns for me about Equestria's youth, because, I mean, bullying and discrimination have been seen so many times, and we've also seen a couple of different foals who've just run away from home. I mean, we had Cheese Sandwich's sad past, and then Diamond Tiara being convinced to bully people, and then Starlight went down her path, and now we've got Fizzle Pop. I, I really love that name, by the way. It's just I agree with Pinky, it is best name ever. <laughs> and her name brings me to next part I want to talk about, a couple of more subtle things about uh, Tempest Fizzlepop there that aren't really brought up in the movie, but are very plain, I think. Like, very obvious. Her armor, and specifically the location of the Storm King's mark on her armor. It's where her cutie mark should be, and... I know that cutie marks are a big deal, like, oh, we don't understand them. It's been stated to us that a cutie mark is a reflection of who you are. It is the sum of everything about you in one symbol, basically. It can be metaphorical, it can be literal, and it's completely up for interpretation, of course. And it's not impossible for ponies to do things outside their cutie marks, but the cutie marks are the most important things about them, more or less. So, this... I mean, there's been a lot of questions about Fizzle Pop's mark, like what she, what her cutie mark is underneath her armor. A lot of people are like, "Oh, she's a blank flank." Other people are like, "She's got fireworks for a cutie mark." Uh, and others are like, "She has ice cream based on a G3 pony that she's actually based off from." Personally, I think that Tempest's shadow was a blank flank. 
Um, but Fizzlepop, after doing the light show, would have gotten her cue to mark, we just didn't see it. In any case, uh, she has the Storm King's mark on her butt, uh, armor, and it kinda is like saying that her identity was to be his servant. And, I mean, it's kind of cool in a way, because she chose that destiny, but it's also bad because it's like she's just giving up herself, which is just really sad. And moving back around to her name, it goes kind of the same way. Because her name, Tempest, means, like, that that's Storm. And obviously that represents her affiliation with the bad guy, the Storm King. But then you add on Shadow at the end of that, and it's like saying that she's always following him. Her Everything about her shows dedication to this guy. And nothing really about who she herself really is. Which is kind of cool. But also kind of sucks. Whew. So yeah, that's that's the villains and the pacing and whatnot. But there's a lot more to talk about. <laughs> we got a couple of big bits of lore in this movie. Uh, the world outside of Equestria. We've gotten to see a lot of species there that walk on two legs and have either claws or hands. Um, I mean, most species in Equestria and some other species, uh, they tend to walk on all fours, like, except for the dragons. Equestria is, like, the land of the four-legged creatures. Uh, you know, really, before, not counting the dragons, before this, the only similar creature that we ever saw was Iron Will. That's, that's it. That's all we ever saw. And it's just very interesting to know that outside of Equestria, there's this whole world where creatures, like, Capper and the rest of them exist. It's just really odd, but kind of cool, and leaves open a ton of room for fan fictions, of course. Of course, the world outside of Equestria does not seem to be a pleasant place. Kluge Town was full of jerks and con artists, and before the Storm King came along, there were pirates running amok, and it actually seems pretty easy for villains like the Storm King to come about. I mean, he wasn't a very competent villain, so it must have been pretty easy for him to get up to the top then. Another big bit of lore in the Hippogriffs. I mean, it's really nice to know that they exist. I mean, they've been a thing in the fandom for a while. We've even gotten Hippogriff OCs. Thank you, Silver Quill. It, I'm just kind of curious about their origins, because like in the myths, uh, you get a Hippogriff from a griffin and a horse, you know, mating. Uh, I mean, it's possible here. We know, thanks to Lauren Faust, that ponies actually do mate. Um, But we'll never actually hear about their origins like that in the show. So, like, that would be a question that I would ask at a convention. Like, if I ever got to talk to the writers, I'd be like, Hey, where do the hippogriffs come from? Did did some griffins and horses bang? You know, I'd I'd ask that. (laughs) But otherwise, we're not going to ever know. I'm curious about what sort of magic they have, because, like, we see the pearl, but that's kind of its own separate thing, it's like an artifact, but Skystar made bubbles for the main six to breathe, somehow, and that's never really addressed, and we're never really shown any other examples of them doing magic, so I'm kind of curious about that and how it works. And one more thing about the Hippogriffs, a quick note here, uh, Queen Novo's voice actress. I did not recognize her voice actress when I was reacting. I mean, I I recognize the sound of it, not her name. This is the thing that annoys me. (laughs) But it turns out she's actually Bismuth's voice actress from Steven Universe, which is pretty awesome, actually. I really liked liked Bismuth, um, even after she turned out to be kind of bad. Um... But, yeah, it's just just really, really cool. And one more thing for the lore. Magic resistant metal. It's not exactly a new thing. Fans have speculated on it for years, and it's existed in a lot of different fix before the movie came out, given names like Ethereal Iron, which is what I called it in the reaction. Um, It's not named or explained in the movie itself, but its abilities are pretty clear. It can reflect magic or just plain resist it disperse it and it's pretty cool but it's also a little bit scary because it it totally nerfs the ponies possibly even nerfs discord i mean uh 
it might actually explain like Queen Chrysalis's throne a little bit. Like, what if her throne was some sort of ore, like uh, a naturally occurring variation of that metal? We don't know, but it's pretty cool. Next up, I, I want to talk about the uh, the more controversial scene, um, the one between Twilight and Pinkie Pie. Uh, you probably know the one I'm talking about. It's the the one where after Twilight st- tries to steal the pearl, they start kind of yelling at each other, and then Twilight basically says she doesn't, or she would be better off if they weren't her friends. At first, it kind of did seem to come out of nowhere, and I've seen a few f- folks uh, being a little bit harsh on Twilight or Pinky or both in their um, reactions. But I think it was actually set up really nicely from the beginning. Uh, Twilight being told that she could basically do anything all on her own. Uh, thank you, princesses, for that. And then, like, during her part in the song We Got This Together, she only really sang about herself and her own responsibility. She was putting all of the pressure on herself. And that didn't change after the invasion. I mean, if you go back and listen to the part where they're talking by the river... Twilight's basically saying, this is on me. You guys can come if you want, but I, I, it's up to me, not you guys. And, I mean, she's not blameless. She's, it's not, like, entirely on her, like, the blame for that scene. Like, throughout the movie, her friends didn't actually seem to be taking things seriously from her point of view. I mean, we in the audience knew that what they were doing was more or less working, but... Yeah. I fully accept that scene... And I think it's amazing and heartbreaking to watch. And now we go from that to talking about music, because I mentioned we got this together. Uh, yeah, the songs in this movie, they're they are just they are amazing. Probably something to do with the fact that Mike Vogel was writing the lyrics for them. <laughs> so we'll go through each of them. Uh, we got this together. I'm not counting We Got the Beat, because that's not technically a song just made for this movie, I don't think. But yeah, uh, as I said, it was a nice conflict or nice setup for the conflict. Um, it also just does really well to show off all the characters. Like, we got a little bit of them prior to the song, but during the song, it just does a great job of going through each one and letting them do their thing. And it was... It, it had a nice rhythm that got me dancing to it, so it's really great. The Friend You Need, or how whatever the title is. Uh, Capper's Song. I'm not entirely sure about that one. The lyrics are great, and the visuals are on point, and the the rhythm and flow to it is lovely. But, um, I don't know, uh, Ty Diggs, I think, was his name, the guy who voiced Capper. For some reason, like, during the song, it just it didn't feel like it had enough energy behind it. Like, he wasn't giving it everything. It was like, it's almost like they told him to dial it back for some reason. Like, it never peaked. It felt like... The entire song felt like a giant tease. Like, I was waiting for the climax, and it just... It never really happened. Because... Partly because of the song being interrupted to actually do the reveal of Capper being a no-good sleaze, but... You know, it, it just it didn't work out for me towards the end. I guess. I don't know. Next one worked out for me, though. Time to be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. That's a great word for this song, even though it comes up too often in the song. (laughs) I do wish we'd gotten a little bit more time with the pirates beforehand. An extra five or ten minutes on the ship would have been amazing. But the song itself is a treat. There are there can never be enough Rainbow Dash songs. Like Rainbow Dash is the one pony that does like rock songs. So need more Rainbow Dash songs, please. And the energy in this one is just very consistent it's just consistently good all the way through and i love it after that we have one small thing i i don't really know what to say for this song because like the first time i watched it i was like yeah but every time since then it's just gotten better and better i love Pinkie pie i love her songs and i'm starting to love sky star too more each time i watch the movie and the song it starts off so slow but it ends up being one of the most uplifting and it and just dance-worthy songs of the entire movie. So just, I guess I guess it's just, it's like a 10 out of 10. It's just going to keep getting better, too. So, there you go. And finally, we have Open Up Your Eyes, the villain song, which, as I said, is probably the most memorable for both 
the visuals and the fact that it's a big part of the story. Just Tempest's emotions were so amazing. And there's also the fact that for us in the real world, uh, her words, the lyrics, they really do ring true quite a bit. Yeah, all around, the song just serves to make her very sympathetic, and the backstory, the tragedy of it actually makes sense. And Emily Blunt's voice is just gorgeous. Goes low-pitched and whispery, but then she's able to hit the high notes on the chorus. Just, ah, it's amazing. As you can probably tell, I mean, I'm, I'm a Tempest and Fizzle Pop fan. But I, I suppose I should talk about the other characters a little bit. Grubber, as I already said, my least favorite of the new characters, and I already ran over why, so I'm not going to do that again. Capper, um, he's cool, I guess. He's not really my favorite. I like cats, so he does have that going for him, but I don't really appreciate characters who take advantage of our innocent heroes, so it's a mixed bag there. Of the Hippogriffs, Skystar is probably the only important one. I mean, Novo a little bit, but not really. Skystar herself, I, I kind of found her annoying at first, but she's really grown on me once I recognized how close she was to Pinkie Pie. And once she stopped being a fish, yeah. I think I kind of have a thing for bird, bird girls. I mean, from this franchise, you had Gilda, Gilda and Gabby, um, and now Skystar, and then, like, go over to one of my other favorite animated films, Rise of the Guardians. You got Toothiana there. I really enjoyed Rio. Yeah. And we do have one more to talk about who's also a bird girl. Captain Salano. Ah, finally glad that I know her name. Yes, she's she's my favorite of the new characters. Absolutely. Rebellious, badass, she-pirate. I mean, what's not to love? It also helps that Zoe Saldana is one of the few celebrity crushes that I retain. Um, I don't really care for most celebrities, but for some reason, I really like her. What more can I say? The character of Captain Solano is very cute. She's awesome. Moving on. <laughs> we're moving on to the ending here. We're gonna wrap things up. I don't want this review to be too long. I think it's long enough. So, in conclusion, uh, this is not a perfect movie. The hippogriffs were mainly there only to sell toys. You could cut them out and basically lose nothing. And some parts, like the pirates allying with the main six, they went by too fast. And some of the new characters are a little bit annoying and unnecessary. But the movie is fun. It is a great animated film. It's not quite like Disney Pixar level, but it is up there with some of DreamWorks stuff. And in terms of MLP, like G4 material, I'd put it on level with Legend of Everfree for myself. Like, season four finale, Rainbow Rocks, and uh, the episode Heartswarming Tale, like my favorite episode ever, those are all above Legend of Everfree and therefore above this movie. Um, also the season 6 finale. But it's better than the season 5 finale, the season 2 finale, and also Friendship Games. I mean, it's up there with the best. If for some reason you haven't watched the movie yet, go watch it. I'm gonna go rewatch it after this myself, so yeah. See ya. Mm-hmm.